Well, for those of you who live in snow country, or live in snow country, you'll appreciate the fact of how rangy a person's yard can look after the snow disappears. Ugh. At least I don't have like old refrigerators and cars and snowmobiles in the yard. Um, but such is life, such is the circle of the air. I am going to discuss several things um, with you today. First of all, you know, it's funny. I look at, I, I watch other videos. I certainly watch other bow videos and crossbow videos and just really bizarre things. In fact, I found this thing, um, uh, Tammy the Trailer Trash Girl. I, I don't know what her channel is, but it's a riot. I guess if you just like do a search on YouTube for Tammy Trailer Trash, you're gonna find like a series of really wild videos. It, it sums up the, the majesty of, of mankind humankind but crossbows are an interesting subject when you're when you're broaching I've, I've wanted to use that word for a while when you're broaching the subject of crossbows you know you jump from typically you know from they were used in Asia of course but typically people think of those those massively heavy steel prodded things that they've used in Europe um, uh, for a while, going way back, maybe a thousand years, don't quote me on that. Amazing draw, um, draw weights, amazing draw weights. I think they, they even go over a thousand pounds. Contrasting it with the English longbow, which was an amazing weapon, simplicity, simplicity times ten, but wholly effective. Of course, there's discussions on the draw weights of English war bows. I've seen on some videos. You might be surprised, but not everyone that comments on videos knows what they're talking about. The English war bows were drawn to 40 inches, were at least 300 pounds in draw weight, and could puncture 8-inch thick oak doors. Well, let's not go that route. Let's consider a 100 pound. Let's consider a 100 pound English war bow, okay? Contrasted with a, a crossbow of a thousand pounds, a thousand pound crossbow. And people are, well, the crossbows were used because they could puncture armor. The crossbows were used because they could knock people off their horses. Amazingly, if you consider the amount of foot pounds of energy um, of that that ballistic device, that arrow or that bolt, as it leaves that weapon, which one would have contained, which one would contain more energy? Um, the arrow shot from a 100 pound English war bow, long draw, 31, 32 inches, or one, a bolt fired from a crossbow of a thousand pounds. You may be surprised, but <laughs> you know, if you punch the numbers, if you run those those, those projectiles through a chronograph and then calculate the amount of foot-pounds of energy or joules, the war, bow can, the war bow sends a projectile with more energy than the crossbow does. Part of it is the efficiency, well, I mean all of it is the efficiency, but part of it is due to the long draw. And and this has to do with my, my crossbow project. So hang in there. And it also should like make Mick a little happier with his 80 pound um, prod. He was shooting for more. But that longbow is able to draw so much farther so you've got a tremendous push stroke. Um, it's, that, that arrow is under acceleration for a great distance because of the draw length. Whereas if you look at a lot of these reproductions of steel prodded crossbows, whether or not it's a 300 pounder or a 600 pounder or that 1,000 pounder, their push stroke is incredibly short. In some instances, these crossbows are only pushing that bolt from their, their, their grasp four and a half inches, compared to, depends on the brace height, let's just say in the 20s for an English war ball. And so there's a more ability for that that device to impart energy into the, the arrow or the bolt. Something to think about. We, we usually can come up with the reason why. Why was everyone armed after a while? 
most everyone with crossbows and not bows. Um, they're, they're more expensive to make, they're more complicated to make, um, harder just to string, you know, because it took a lot less training. Um, the people that use the English war bows, highly trained individuals, trained for years and years and years, literally modifying their skeletal structure and their muscula musculature to be able to pull those things. And, and so, whereas you could just outfit any, any hooligan, you know, hay, hiding behind a haystack with a crossbow, and in a day, you know, they would be fully capable of killing people, it would take years to be adept at using a, an English war bow, or, you know, a, a long bow, let's just say that. And so it's not a question of one was better than the other. In all fairness, it's, aside from in tight quarters, you know, my personal belief that is that the, the war bow was a superior weapon. It was lighter. It was easier to produce. It was um, more efficient, much, much more efficient than a crossbow. Just took a lot more training to use. And, and with that, let's jump to the next subject, which is related. The wooden prod crossbow. Mick, if you're watching this, do not, do not um, feel bad, my friend, because your elm prod that you have been making, which I, I believe you said you wanted to do it between 100 and 150 pounds, and it turned out at 80 pounds at 10 inches of draw, compare that to a steel prodded crossbow with a 4.5 inch um, power stroke. The power stroke of your prod is greater by a big factor than that steel prod. And so your 80 pound prod um, could possibly, I, I didn't do any numbers, I don't have a chronograph and I don't have testing, but I would suspect that your, your 80 pound wooden elm prod would probably be as efficient and as, as good at throwing an arrow and impart as much energy, pardon me, a prod, no, pardon me, a bolt, crossbow stuff um, as a 300 pound crossbow so you know you're, you're not out of it the, the big deal is how much um, draw length you can get from that creature that is why you know I I really adore this as a material this Osage Osage you know one of these days I'm gonna get that right is that this Osage um, prod Osage in itself will be able to give me um, more draw weight and, and a greater draw length than elm or maple. Um, you know, for those hickory people out there, I've made amazingly heavy, heavy short bows out of hickory that were overdrawn, that suffered no ill effects. The only difference being that, that hickory, those hickory bows that I made, comparable to Osage, they will gain strength follow. Um, to a higher degree than Osage. So this will have a, a good power stroke. I'm hoping, you know, we all have our, our, our goals. I would love to have a 100 pound Osage prod without sinew that could handle a, a 14 inch um, draw, which would give it over a 10 inch power stroke which should make this one humdinger, I apologize for you young people out there hearing rough language like that, one humdinger of a crossbow that should be comparable to a much, much heavier steel prodded crossbow. Another thing that steel has is I believe it, it, it has a higher amount of hysteresis, which is a fancy word of just saying internal friction when it is drawn and released. Um, <clears throat> certain amount of energy goes into heat, and so um, this would be less, less hysteresis. That's a funny word. Okay. Um, the limbs would be physically lighter, so there's less mass to move, so it would be more efficient. You lose some efficiency if you don't have it set in there, and a the string is like dragging on there, but you just can fig, fix that by canting it a little bit. So all in all, good deal. Now I had a question. Hello, Country R. Country Air was asking me about this. I'm going to give you a close-up and then go into why I use it and how I use it. This is just a simple thing. Um, there's a little 
thumb buttony thing. It's held down with a rubber band. I do not have a screw and a and a wing nut. It doesn't matter because when I'm using this, just simple. There's so many ways to do it. And then a hole drilled through there. It looks like a, a closed pin in the rubber band that clamp it down. When you're using this, your thumb is on there, so you've got great friction and you're not pulling down on it, you're pushing in. So just a simple little friction device um, works wonders. Actually, I'll be right back. I move like a cat, like a really old cat. Now if you've bought this, you'll notice there's big margins around here. It was actually scanned from my notebook. It is literally my notebook. I had a problem, full disclosure, um, getting this uh, onto the, the book form on Amazon. I would really wanted to have less margins here. Um, it is what it is. The nice thing is you can make notes in here, so that's good. I've got my Scribomatic. Just the quality of my drawings. I am a good drawist. And it describes it in detail, the scribomatic, and then split allows for tight fit, notch, rides long back of bow, rubber band supplies pressure to friction block. I encourage everyone to make some form of scribing tool. In my early days, I would cut a strip of cereal box and ride it along the length of the limbs. To explain what that means, just picture, and you can do this, you cut a strip of cereal box, and you put it along the back, and you just take your pencil and run it along that. That works. That works really well. Um, <clears throat> but this device took such little time to make and worked so well it has become one of my favorite tools. In fact, if you're to go, let me back up so I don't scare you with, with my presence. Go to a lot of bow videos. The first step, floor tiller it, and then you put a string on there and you get the bend. Boy, this is like stiff as heck. And then you adjust it that way. I can actually skip a lot of that um, with my scribing tool, getting it to basically a tillered bow before even putting it on the tillering um, tree or tillering stick. You mark center line. All bows need to have center line. Step one, got the center line. And then I will take on the side in general, maybe a quarter break this into fourths or thirds however you want to do that doesn't really matter doesn't really matter but do a line I did it in quarters on this one a quarter um, the half is not marked and then the, the last quarter then I estimate this is a shorter bow um, so generally on a longer D bow I would do a half an inch I would set this for a half an inch and I would scrap it I'll just do it what the heck I have to sand this off anyway Zoom half an inch. I would tighten it up a little bit, so I'm going to get a distinct line, um, a thinner line there, and from that quarter, a little beyond, scribe it. Scribe it here to the quarter so it's thinner. I've got the half inch line and then a thinner one on the tips. Now I'm going to make this bigger. I would set this to three quarter inches for a D-ball. And then between um, the quarter mark here and the quarter mark here, center of the handle, I'd make it fatter. Then I would work it down, usually with my rasp to the line, but instead of having a step, thin, step, and then a step again, by eye, I would just, I would taper it, I would grade it so it's a smooth transition, I'll, transition, also using the growth rings as a guide. And so with that half inch, 60 inch Debo, it varies depending on the wood, half an inch, a little thinner, a little thicker, and even from side to side, I would go like this and it would be like, oh my goodness, I just have a tillered bow. All I need to do now is just reduce it, either by scraping, and that's like from the center out, nice smooth strokes because it's basically tillered it just needs to be reduced other side um, tillering stick but I would basically have a nice taper in here you can do thirds sometimes I do a third sometimes I do a quarter doesn't matter all that does is change the degree of where that bend is 
a lot of different ways to um, tiller a bow. They don't all have to be the same. What you don't want to have is a hangy spot or too much bend in one zone. You want to have it distributed. So whether it's a quarter or a third, all that does is just change the curve. But a curve is what you have. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, at this stage. See, I worked it down. It's definitely, this thing is a brute. I want to reduce it, but you notice how thin this is throughout here? That means it's going to be very, very easy to then, I got to keep creeping down here, by sighting it in my sanding block, because I don't have to remove like an inch of wood down here, it's, it's thin, so it works fast with 80 grit. Getting rid of any like protuberance on the side. I can sight down here and I can see a protuberance right here. And just evening that out. After I resand this, getting this perfect, it'll have the final shape. Then I sharpen my pencil. I sharpen my pencil. And I'm going to rescribe this thing probably three-eighths of an inch through the, the maximum portion, then a little thinner here, then a little thicker here. And I believe that three-eighths of an inch, because think about it, when this thing bends, you're going to have movement and tension, movement and compression. The thicker it is, the more movement, actual movement you're going to have. Three-eighths of an inch will not have excessive movement through here. It'll be a heavy ball. I'll have a draw length, but three-eighths of an inch should work nicely to give me a heavy, heavy ball, be able to bend because that three-eighths of an inch, when you figure the angles and the movement and all this geometric um, witchcraft, this will be able to live through being drawn three-eighths inch thick through middle ends. Um, now I can certainly adjust it. What I want to do is guess how much draw weight I can have with this, which is going to be like a mystery. Sometimes you can tell, sometimes you can't tell, you know, when suddenly that last half inch makes it explode. Do my best. I could certainly cover this thing up, and I might. Not finish it, use it as crossbow, demonstrate it, take it off, and send you back it. On a bow this short, and just like Mick, he's got that elm prod. Um, if it's about this long, and you put a good layer on here, you're going to increase the draw weight by a huge factor, probably about 20 pounds. Um, and, and, and so there we are. I would be reluctant to put a thin layer on here. If you've got a heavy bow like this, being relatively overdrawn, and a thin layer is seen you, that thin layer is not going to be able to absorb the amount of tensional um, energy to keep this thing alive. You have to have a thick layer. You have to have a bunch of sinew on here on a heavy, heavy, heavy bow. Um, a bow that's not that stressed, you can get away with a thinner layer of sinew. On a very stressed bow, you got to have a lot of sinew or else it's going to just shear. Now with that, it is time to eat breakfast and then work on this bow. I appreciate you sticking through my videos, you know, there's not a lot of, here I am working, here I am tillering, here I am doing this. I, I like to think of my videos as kind of a bow maker's um, video, that you're, you're willing to, you want to make a bow, and, and you, you have the foundation. Who has not? Raise your hand if you haven't seen somebody in another video putting a bow on a tillering tree and then pulling it back and watching the bend and saying, this is where it's stiff, remove it. You know that. What I want to do is bring other things um, to bear. The way of scribing, um, the thoughts on, you know, the wooden prods versus the steel prod, the bow maker's notebook, all this good stuff. Have a great day. Thank you for watching. And probably the cars are slowing down behind me because the turkeys are wandering around. I ditched them. They're on the other side of the house.